Okay. All right, it is uh, six o'clock, January 25th. This is uh, the meeting of the Manitowoc Public School District's Board of Education, and uh, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Colin Brunel. Here. Matthew Fix. Here. Stacy Selmer. Here. Matthew Spalding. Carrie Trask. Here. Tony Glastelica. Here. Kathy Willis. Here. Thank you. Okay, and then we have um, a few items in our consent agenda. Um, personnel meeting minutes, our regular and closed session board meeting minutes from January 10th and also January 17th curriculum committee meetings, minutes. Any of those that need to be um, taken out of the consent agenda? Okay, um, and I'm looking for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I'll move. I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. And then we move on to our report of the superintendent. The first um, item we have on there is our uh, personnel report. And I'm looking for a motion and a second to approve the personnel report. Make a motion. I'll second. Okay, any discussion on the personnel report? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Uh, uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, and our second, um, Item on here is our administrator contracts, and I'll be looking for a motion in a second to approve those. Motion. I, I, okay. Oh. No one said Well, you still have the opportunity to discuss. Yep, I know. And do I have a second on that at all? I'll second. All right. Any discussion? Yeah, I I would like Jamie McCall's uh, Jamie McCall's um, contract pulled. I just don't think it belongs. Everybody else here. Is somebody we already have on staff. We already have. Um, I mean, uh, I, 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 I haven't, I, I haven't seen anything on her. You know, I haven't seen any credentials. I haven't seen the contract. I, I don't know if anybody has. And I think that you know, when we, we take so much effort in the personnel committee to decide on whether you know Monroe should have a, a pair of a, a, a pair of teacher or something like that. Um, and I mean, this has never really gone through committee at all, but you know, everybody else, of course, is, is, an, is an employee who's here now, and we know who they are, and we, we kind of have an idea of what you know what the conditions of their employment are. I just think that Jamie is an exception to that, and I don't want to vote for the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole line there because I think because of that exception, okay, Colin. Um, for the uh. Uh, sake of information, as far as the um, contracts, is there a certain, uh, do we, I mean, as far as the contracts, do they go in groups and chunks as far as how that is laid out? Is there like, we do the administration <laughs> of two-year chunks and? Yes, Mike, you want to ex uh, explain um, the reason for the contracts coming up at this time? Sure. sure. Um, um, con con contract. Right now, the administrators have a contract uh, for June or July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2024. And what, what you are doing tonight as a board is considering extending their contracts one year, June, July 1 of 24 through June 30 of 25. It is common, it is common, very, very common, uh, that administrators have a two-year contract. The two-year contract is the maximum allowed by law, obviously, Wisconsin statute. But the purpose, the reason why it's important to have a two-year contract is to provide those, those administrators with stability and, and, and knowing that, that they have at least a two-year commitment to the district and the district has at least a two-year commitment to them. Does that help? Yes, 
does and so that would be by to to pull or to put Jamie in a specific category outside of that two-year window that would be a isolation that is uncustomary correct correct Jamie currently has a contract for the remainder of this school year and then July 1 of 23 through July June 30th of 24 so it would be common to extend that contract, that extension of one year, so that she would be offered a two-year contract. Um, Carrie, did you want to make a motion to have that removed? Yeah, I want to. I want to make a motion then, because Jamie is an exception here, um, and because it's you know, you know, she hasn't she hasn't worked any time yet to warn necessarily action on a two-year contract that I think there's some questions that need to be asked about that and 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 we certainly can we can certainly vote after that's discussed okay is there a second to that motion I'll second the motion for discussion <clears throat> okay is there any discussion on that then the only thing I'm concerned about is I've not in the business of negotiating Jamie's contract the superintendent is so like I understand maybe if you didn't get disclosure about the language of the contract, I could understand you wanting to review that, but I don't make the contract with her. So that's why I wouldn't need to review it. I have more than what I've already reviewed of the amount that it is. Sure. So. I think the other thing is um, that I would bring up, um, you know, Colin and I were seated on the board uh, this happened at Wilson Junior High School. If you remember, we were brought into a room. I do remember, yes. Uh, I and do remember. I specifically yes. asked how we were making these decisions based on no information. Yeah. Um, and um, the the reason why um, personnel, those don't come to personnel is because they're administrators. And so administrative positions are Right, I understand. Right, vetted, you know, um, and their performance, and it's a recommendation that comes from the superintendent. So, you know, that's just another reason um, is that we take that recommendation from our superintendent. Oh, okay. I, I think that because it's a controversial appointment, and if you've ever looked at any emails or the um, the Facebook stuff, it's a controversial. It's a controversial. Um, Appointment, then I would, I would, you know, if we're, if, if Jamie's going to work here, I, I, I want to have transparency on that. And I want to, you know, I want to clear up whatever concerns you, there are. Did you vote to, in order to legitimize? Did you vote her to, the did you vote to hire her when we had her? I wasn't, I wasn't present at that. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Colin? So, I mean, what, you know, I guess it's one thing to, to pull out. So if there's, at what point do you draw the line where somebody is a controversial employee and non-controversial employee? And then also to that, then also, should we be, um, should we be seeking uh, to find out what Facebook says about every single employee here? Right. And then and then respond in yeah, but and I then we second, on, but can sorry. I finish, please? Oh, so then we should be second guessing every uh, appointment that the superintendent then then does, and then we're micromanaging his position. That's the concern that I would have to this, and I have no interest in doing that. Yeah. And I would also say that it's a highly, highly, highly inappropriate to have if we've not been told one time, we've been told a million times. To single out one position and one person by name in a public forum such as this. All I'm all I'm doing is saying I would like a postponement on the vote on that one particular person in that position, since nobody else on this list. You know, I haven't seen anything on on them uh, that raises raises questions that are pretty pretty. Pretty much circulating in the whole community, and, and I, I, you know, I just want, 
They want us to be responsible and they want us to be transparent. On Did this. you vote for uh, the last time we extended the contracts without any information on everyone else that we had last time we did this? When uh, Mr. Holzman was Yeah, I did. I voted yes. I voted okay. yes. Thank you. And, you know, and of course you, you didn't. And um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the thing is, is that I don't think this is, I don't think this is highly unusual. And I don't think it's micromanaging. I just think it's like being <clears throat> cautious and uh, responsible. So, any that, further discussion at all? Yeah, yeah, I would just like to add. You know, I I understand there's differing opinions on the issue, uh, but just to remind everyone the reason we're all here uh, is that you know the, today, right now, our kids are reading below thirty percent from efficiency for levels. The superintendent, in my opinion, has the absolute right to build the structure he sees fit. If we're going to hold him accountable to that, we have to empower him to, to build that team. And I fully support Jamie being on this team. Well, that's good. I mean, you know, I think everybody has to vote their conscience on this. And I, I, that's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this to be a juror. I, mean, I just think I didn't that, suggest you were. I was just. Out and I don't think it, I don't think I'm doing it because I want the students not to have you know good reading scores either. So I you know it's not it's not that. Before we have an extended two year contract for somebody who's just been recently hired. Well, we just heard what Mike said. It's common, right? I mean, nothing about this is uncommon, right? That's what he said. Yeah. If I if I could just add that when we hire an administrator. It would be rare that we wouldn't offer them a two-year contract. Most often, if, if you hire an administrator and you say, we're, go, we're only going to give you a one-year contract, they're going to look at me and say, what? And they're going to, they're, most likely, they're not going to come. Um, so it's very, very, very common to hire a new administrator with a two-year contract. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, look, you know, I've had my say, you, you vote. You vote your own yeah. conscience and all that. I am. I'm voting for what's coming. Oh, yeah. Um, is there any further discussion? Okay, so the vote on the floor um, is to um, accept the report without um, Jamie McCall's extended uh, contract. All in favor? Oh, I'll vote. I I'm sorry. Any opposed? Nay. Nay, nay. Okay, motion does not carry. Okay, so the original motion on the floor is to approve uh, the recommendation of the administrative contracts that has been presented in board book. And we have a motion and a second on that. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 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 Yes. Okay. All right, motion carries. Okay, the next um, item under the report of the superintendent is um, our open enrollment for pupils with disability. Um, we need a motion in a second to approve that uh, report. Make a motion. Okay, and um, uh, Katie, did you want to speak to that at all? Um, did anyone have any questions about the document? I just have one simple question. I just noticed that everything was closed except for missing. So how many spots do we typically have up there and how many are available currently? Um, all of our programs are closed with the, including all of the programs that we have. So oh, it, it is, yep. Um, the only, <clears throat> the only programming that we would have available for next year for non-resident students with disabilities would be two openings at our 4K level. Um, and that's based on the state formula for working capacity and um, COs. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any okay, I just was going to ask, um, if a if a student prior to that moves um, out and there's a spot available, does that change then this form? It does not. Okay. So tonight's approval of this capacity for our open enrollment of students with disabilities makes that determination for all of next for the year. Okay. 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 Any other um, questions um, or comments about that? Okay. Seeing none. Um, 
all in favor of um, moving forward with the open enrollment for pupils with disabilities for the 23-24 school year? Um, say aye. Aye. Okay. aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, then we have an uh, informational update uh, about our strategic plan, Jim. Uh, just to identify that, you know, because of the absence of the uh, consultant not being available, you know, we've moved the decision making for the strategic plan to February 14th. Okay. So that will be on that agenda. And currently we're working on uh, the uh, performance metrics mm -hmm. uh, uh, for um, how we're going to track our progress, you know, as well as the development of our scorecard. So uh, we're currently working uh, with Brett and my executive team and Jamie's working back with principals uh, and the like to get good performance measures. Uh, okay. place. How, how is that going? Uh, well, we recognized in terms of where we thought we had some um, data management uh, tools available. Mm -hmm. um, we're finding ourselves that we might have to be putting some in the hand. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And then also the 2023 referendum. Uh, just right now, since the board's adopted that, we're uh, involved in preparing fact sheets and some presentation materials. There will be a lot of information in terms of making sure that the public understands uh, what the referendum would be used for. Uh, and so we're into that. And every month, on the, every meeting, we will have an update on this. We will continue to have more information. Calendar will be at will doing presentations. We'll be at the app and the like. Uh, so we'll continue to form. Yes. Are there any upcoming presentations? Um, for the uh, the topic, but we the, are setting up calendar scheduled. right now. Nothing has been scheduled. Not, at this nothing time. scheduled at this time. Okay. okay. Any other questions about the referendum? Okay. Um, then we move on to unfinished business. Um, we have um, a success for all update. Yeah. There's two components here. One is we made two more site visits, and so that's the fall. But uh, the first thing is just in terms of what uh, one of the things that the board's asked for is the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so Angela's provided a uh, cost comparison here in terms of the two estimates. Um, but first of all, which you are aware of, but just again to, to help the public understand also that we're not comparing an apples to apples you know, situation here. As the board has noted now a number of times you know, during public sessions, um, we are looking at a whole school reform initiative, meaning that you're looking in terms of where we're at, what we need to do to elevate our achievement level. Uh, is it just a curriculum component or do we need to do something you know, that's much broader? We're looking at systems, we're looking at structures uh, and consistency and also training. You know, we've heard a number of times of training. And so while the whole school uh, component has a significant foundation on based on literacy, it's much more than that. You know, so when you're looking at costs, you have to understand that. Uh, so, um, and that is comparing itself to, you know, how we've done before where we're picking a curriculum item, one that's critically important to us because we recognize, you know, um, the, the damage or the loss that we've experienced, you know, in terms of our current, current curriculum that we've been using, you know, so the importance of changing that. But as I've identified, you know, we see something much more. I was starting off with two pilot schools in, you know, just through... Should we have two different systems or should we have one system that's opened up now to looking at the, to both? So going with that, then Angela can speak on this a little bit more, but you put a nice summary together you know, in terms of, and I would highlight a couple of things here. If you're looking at the, the cost item, one thing that you'll see that should stand out to you, and then uh, Angela actually broke that out is professional development. One of the major cost components of success for all is very much uh, um, uh, the training, uh, a significant training thing. It isn't just giving you tools in terms of health things and you where you look up, there's a lot of training. You know, we're sending people to training and then people come out throughout the year, you know, for training. So it's 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 a substantial investment uh, in our teachers uh, to make sure that they're equipped to, to implement the curriculum um, and it's the entire curriculum, you know, so it's involving a lot of staff. So I would highlight that. Um, so if you're looking at you can see where she's broken out just the materials and licensing. You're comparing 1.1 million for something that's much broader than just literacy to 740,000. And then you can look at the training component of the success for all 883,000 compared to 37,004. So I just highlight that to extend of, um, you know, understanding clearly um, um, what we're considering here in terms of what that cost stands for. Okay. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a bit of mission creep here, isn't there? I mean, 
when we originally talked about this, it was to have a pilot program at Franklin and, um, and, and Washington. At Washington. And I thought, that's a good idea. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I know there's been a lot of other discussion about this. And I still think that, you know, there's a, there's a good deal of, of unknownness about, about this. I mean, it hasn't worked everywhere. And um, to do the pilot seems to make a lot of sense to me. And, and yet here these prices are, are for the whole system, right? I'd like to know what, what it costs to do the, the original proposal. The original proposal was 750,000 for three schools. And then we, we pared that down to deciding only to go with two and then okay. the discussion opened up to should we, and we had a lot of feedback, you know, part of the challenge against the pilots, as you might recall, is we shouldn't have two systems. I mean, that was the- I don't the, recall we ever voted on that. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, what I'm suggesting is in terms of what you received in terms of public comment, you know, uh, was, was that that was not a good thing to do, to have two systems. And then we've had some discussions on that. Okay. Uh, at our board, and that's how it's opened up. Uh, and then we started just exploring more. Okay, what, what, you know, what's the benefit of this? And then what's the benefit of it doing across the school district uh, instead of just two? Well, then the, the other question I have is sort of the, the magnitude thing, too. And that why I don't remember having any discussion about why we need a complete, you know, you know, re-rig the, re the system thing. I thought we initially started off talking about reading, reading scores and academic achievement and that, and how that would have a, a beneficial, a tremendously beneficial impact on on everything else. But I, I'm yet to know what these, what these other things are in terms of a whole school database, you know, reform, reform program. And I know that the other the other proposal uh, is not that it's it's almost exclusively a reading program. Right? Um, so in a sense, we we are like you say we've got apples and oranges here, and I'd like to know uh, if success for all is an apple. You know why we need why we need as big a one as we're proposing or is being proposed, but that's for that's for another time. But I'm, you know, I'm concerned about that as well. So, I mean, I think that part of the discussion that was had was, is, you know, when we when we were doing a pilot, what would be the consequence of one um, one set of, uh, of of children operating under one premise, and another set of children operating on another premise, and then they meet at another at the you know at the high school. And then there is a new challenge that we have then created. Um, and that was, I think, the, the, the rationale behind avoiding the, the pilot because when those, you know, when those pilots and non-pilots meet, then you you're also have another gap as well. So I think that that was part of the discussion that, you know, we'd all been part of that the pilot would have would create new challenges that we don't want to create. We would like to try and address some of the, the problems that we're, that we're facing with a solution. And this, this solution has been not just to touch on the reading, it has not just been to touch on the math, but also to touch on the behavioral problems that we've had. And this is all, and that's why it's being proposed as a reform, not curriculum, because when you have the reform, you're also reforming processes and then the way the things and that's some of the things that the teachers have that and the staff have, have noted that when they go to these schools how those kids are interacting with the staff has been noticeable and not just small noticeable big noticeable but also some of these things we're still we are doing in our schools currently and so this is bringing some of these things all together into a package yeah, that's where the process. You know, my only, I process. just want to, to make two observations. Number one is that um, I thought the pilot thing was a good idea because, you know, expanding it to the whole the whole school system is based on the assumption that this thing is really really going to work. I don't know that, and I and I and I, I don't know how you know that either. 
And I thought with the pilot thing, we could try it out. Never works. Damn, you know. Then let's 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 put the whole system in. But but if we put everybody in together and it doesn't work, we're going to be behind where we are now. And I don't care about the discrepancies between the kids at two schools and the rest of the schools if it's a failure. So the other thing is, is that in terms of the discipline stuff, we had a perfectly fine committee that made a perfectly fine report on, you know, on the, uh, the, what, what, what's it, what's it called? The code of contest. And that has not been implemented. That's not been implemented at all. I mean, I, I don't think there's been any any hint that that's had any effect at all. And, uh, and you know, why do we also need, you know, why do we also need to have success for all with com component on something that we're already working on if it was only put into effect? But as I just got done saying, Terry, that we do have a lot of these processes in play that are already going. They're just not working together. So hence the reason this is a reform to bring all these processes together under one package. Behavior as well is one of those components. And we're seeing when we go to the schools, we've done the diligence, we've done the research, we've had them visit. And we're seeing that this actually can be beneficial to our district. It's not that, you know, and, and it's not that, you know, we haven't looked into it. We've been researching this for a long time. Oh, and, wow. and, 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 well, I'll, I, you know. We do have, um, uh, nevertheless. Part, of the, part of this is also to um, listen to the teachers that went this last trip too. So um, we're not here to make a decision today. I know. So, um, I'm just good, raising, good reminder, thank you. Raising, I think, you know, reasonably, reasonably appropriate questions. I think that's, yeah. I think that's a fair point, and, but I think we should also acknowledge that there's no guarantee any program will work. Right? That's and, true. That's so true. I, and you know, everything's going to have some element of risk, and I think the more due diligence we do, uh, the less that risk becomes. And so far, with what I've seen from the schools that have implemented SFA, I think it looks real promising. You know, I think there's a lot of similarities between our district with the challenges we face with demographics uh, and schools that have implemented it successfully that we'd love to recreate here. So, you know, I think there's a lot of promise there. I think that, you know, I think that's a fair question. And I, I guess the other question I had, Jim, um, you know, just looking at the professional development uh, costs, which are, they're obviously a lot higher. Can you speak to that a little bit more and, and why are they so much more? Is that related to like that systems part of it? or It is part of the systems. It's part of, uh, in, in terms of what does uh, cooperative learning look like uh, in action? And, and I would think in most schools now, because we understand the significance of that research behind cooperative learning, that it's important that there isn't the typical uh, sage on the stage, you know, the teacher is up there giving a lecture and it's connecting with two or three kids. You break kids up into small groups. Uh, this this has a complete system in terms of how to do that and to do that consistently. So what happens is, and one of the challenges that we talked about, if kids are going to one school and then they're going to another school and they both have been exposed to something different, we aren't going to get that full return. Uh, and um, you know, so what happens here? Kids start community from the consistency because it's reinforced in all the schools in the same way. Uh, in the same structure, um, and um, in many ways, they help carry the program uh, because they understand it that well. Um, so it takes out a lot of the variation that we might be experiencing now. One of the things that I've received in terms of what's happened with the role of the uh, uh, code of conduct, uh, and it's, you know, some of the feedback that I get is because we've got too much autonomy within our schools. Uh, and, and so there could be various reasons why something is, is being implemented in one school, but not another. Uh, and so we're working that back down really to start putting systems in place to make sure that they're there. And we're regrouping on this because we're recognizing here we've got a, a good component part of that solution. There's much more to that. Um, but, but again, it's raising, um, you know, to, to get us to some consistency with our students and staff in terms of uh, having high expectations and having systems to bring that about. Yeah. 
the only thing I want to say is I'm excited for the report tonight. So that'll be very informational and the research that we've been doing to try to figure out the right decision for our, our district. I want to pair it off of what Colin has been kind of trying to say is that we've been doing a lot of these things already in our district. That's one thing that we heard long and clear already from the research, but we're having these gaps in achievement. We're having these problems. So I'm very, very interested in from what I've been from heard and told from these people is that this systematic approach of putting these things together, the components of reading, behavior, character building, like that's the, we'll call it synergy, we'll call it the idea of putting it together is really what, because uh, you know we're using resources right now, but our achievement isn't, isn't there at all levels like we, we would like to see. So I'm very excited to, to continue to hear the research about how this systematic approach across the board um, would improve the achievement of each student in, in the classroom. So that's what I'm excited to hear about tonight. So, so without further ado. I would just like to make one more point, and, and you have a critical uh, element of time here that's working for you, and it would have even been better if we started this last year because of ESSER funds. You know, ESSER funds, uh, a significant amount of ESSER funds, in particularly in this last allocation, was earmarked for evidence-based best practice. And so you have an opportunity to pay a significant chunk of this money with funds that are one time that was made for this purpose. So, so there's really a timing uh, element here that benefits you because we still have some of these funds left to be able to use. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to switch gears. Um, and it's kind of a okay, because Jim was just speaking to the, the monetary department. I have a question for you, Angela. What is CCEIS? So in here, it's talked about um, success for all may, may be able to get funding through that. I don't know. That oh, no, well, that's part of our, um, that's part of our goal for funding. <laughs> is, uh, I think it's within this before technology works on uh, this meeting the needs of the, the general behavior of the of the whole student total population. So um, we have some, not a lot of funding available there, where we have about one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year that pays for one position, but also supports the programs in the building. So that some of the success for all speaks to just family engagement and. Uh, Parental involvement, all of those types of things, and that just really dovetails, you know, easily into what is part of success for all. So, uh, you know, how much of that we would use, you know, we would not pay down the way, but that is another kind of option. Okay, and then I had one more thing. Um, it talked in here, I don't remember at what point, but about uh, people being sent to Baltimore for training. Would it? You know, I don't know if you really have an answer to this or not tonight, but it may be something that would it be more cost effective to have trainers come here than sending people out there. I'm not 100 percent sure on this, so Jim, okay. Yeah, there is a training component that starts with training in Baltimore, and right. what's 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 really beneficial is you get a significant amount of peers. Uh, in there where teachers are learning off of themselves okay. in this collective capacity. So it's not just our people going to No, it's, it's going to, and it's going to be, and I've attended that session, and oh. it's pretty powerful, you know, in terms of watching teachers and, and principals being engaged. Oh, okay. And so those teams come back and then share with the groups yeah, here. And, then, yeah. and there's just, uh, there's professional development throughout the year at multiple points. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. My last question, is anybody paying you to be successful at all? No. Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> question. Um, did you want to invite them? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so into the next section now. So, Jamie, I'm going to turn this over to you. In terms of you helped uh, organize our two That's last over trips to SFA. So I'm going to turn this over to you. Please. I did. We, we actually visited two different sites. When I say we, it's our team. Uh, we had one group that went to Ohio, so they could look at the middle school and the elementary school and the preschool component. And then another site worked really hard to get to Kansas. Um, they made it a lot earlier than I did, or I guess I was early in the morning. Um, but that was a, we wanted to see a different view of what Success for All looked like. And they were in their, I believe, second or third year of implementation. 
we look at elementary level um, instruction at two different buildings. And then we have the privilege of meeting with their assistant superintendent, a building principal, and then a facilitator. And we were able to ask all the questions we had on our list, which was really helpful. So how about we start with the Kansas team? They are known as the Chicken Brigade. So if they could come up, you can explain why you're back. And then if you'll introduce yourselves, please, and talk about um, or just share the information that you have that you would like to work with. Okay. Uh, I guess you called the Chicken Brigade because, um, long story short, it's fried chicken is very big down there, and decided <laughs> to go out to eat and try it. Um, and then we got pictured by this giant chicken. So yeah, this big joke along the entire trip. So I will let the team introduce themselves. I'm Anna Beatty, uh, principal at Jackson. I'm Michelle Weaver, third grade teacher at Jefferson. Jennifer Hartman, um, literacy coach at Jefferson. Courtney Yarman, principal at Jefferson. Jean Slager, first grade teacher at Jackson. Vicki Hang, ELL teacher at Jackson. So uh, Courtney and I will kind of give you a little bit of background on the district that we did visit. And then our team has created basically a, a benefits, you know, benefits of, of SFA that we saw, um, costs that maybe it's correlated with, yep, you've got a copy of it, perfect. Um, and then lingering questions that our team had along with um, things for us to think about if we were to implement. So um, the district that we went to was Pittsburgh 250 um, in Pittsburgh, Kansas. And the unique experience I think that we had was they had incorporated or they had adopted SFA in their district about 18 years ago. Um, when they did that, it was only two of their elementary schools doing it, and then two, two of their other elementary schools were not participating in SFA. So they did have a split in the district. Um, they said after about, ooh, I wanna say like seven-ish years, yeah, um, they decided to split from SFA. Um, it was the time they said, we asked why, why did you decide to go away from it? They said part of the part of the um, decision to go away from it was the split in the district, the disconnect that they were feeling among their two, their four skills, the four elementary schools. Um, another part of it was the Common Core um, standards were, you know, the new upcoming thing, and they were looking at wonders, which was one of the curriculum pieces, saying, "Hey, we're all about Common Core," so they decided to go that way to try to bring some unity among their schools again. Um, after approximately another eight years or so um, and into our pandemic, they decided we need help. We need to do something different. Our students are not reading. So um, as a district, they decided to go back to SFA um, and adopted it for their elementary schools. So they are not, they did not implement it within their middle schools. Um, <clears throat> and this is their third year now. Uh, they are in their third year of their implementation of SFA. So a little backstory on that. Kate Byer. Kate Byer. So their district is about 3,300 students. So a little smaller than Manitowoc um, in grades K-12. Um, with a free and reduced lunch population around 68%, um, with the majority of those students qualifying for free lunches. Um, about 15% of their students are part of their EL programming, um, with mostly Hispanic students. And their, uh, their secondary EL population is a Marshallese population, which comes from the Marshall Islands. Um, we were able to visit three of their elementary schools. We visited Westside Elementary School, Lakeside Elementary School, and George Nettles Elementary School. Um, Westside Elementary was their smallest school in the district at around 290 students, grades five. Um, their free and reduced lunch population was around 85% um, and, a, and a relatively high EL population. Um, we also visited Lakeside, which was the largest of their elementary schools, around 425 students, so very comparable to Franklin. 
um, their numbers were closer to the average for the district. So mirrored kind of the whole district. Um, and then the visit to George Nettles was very impromptu. So we actually did not really get too much into the demographic <laughs> data, but it happened to be right across the street from their central office. And we were finishing up at the central office and we said, well, let's go see it. And so we zipped right across the street to see some things over there. So I'm going to let the team get started. Um, we have some things to share with you. Um, of uh, the benefits, the costs, our questions, and some of the work throughs for the district. The first category that um, we talked about as of high importance is professional development. And the benefits that we observed while we were in Kansas, um, very strong, dedicated, and ongoing professional development from SFA, as well as from in-house with the SFA facilitator. Um, teachers were never asked to teach a different level, whether it was roots to wings or vice versa, without being trained and comfortable first. Teachers who needed additional support had an opportunity to co-teach with a more experienced teacher for a period of time upon starting that level. So those levels shift at quarters we witnessed or we observed. And um, yeah, if, if they needed that support, it was it was there. Um, that costs, um, we would need to commit to the time and the cost of that professional development. A uh, lingering question that our team had yet for Kansas would have, would be, was there any required summer training involved? And then about that necessary work through before the adoption and implementation um, possibility in Manitowoc would be to determine what professional development opportunities look like in order to fully support the MPSD staff. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the data that they shared with us. Um, their in-house data collection showed some pretty impressive numbers over the last three years. One of the examples was um, their second graders in 2020. Um, they started the school year reading 29% proficient with their in-house data, not state testing data. By fourth grade, that same group of children, if you follow them through the years, their 29% became 62% proficient in-house data. In-house Their in-house data <laughs> is a combination of the SFA assessments that are built into the curriculum. They use a uh, outside tool called FastBridge and they also use just teacher assessment, teacher observation of what's happening during that SFA reading block to put all of that data together. So those are their data pieces. Yeah. So, so. How is that, um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, since you mentioned it a few times, I'm curious, <laughs> did you guys look at this, the actual state data or? Yes, okay. that's that's the next column. <laughs> um, so one of the costs or questions, um, challenges, I guess, was that their state report card did not show that same gain. Um, their state achievement was very similar to the MPSD, still in year three of implementation. So we did um, specifically ask that superintendent, hey, um, no. your state data and our state data is pretty similar why is, is this a program that we should be interested in? Um, I don't have the exact quote, but he said something like, um, if we have a choice between producing students who can read and students who do well on the state test, I'm going to pick kids who can read every time. We found that to be interesting. So um, what we would really like to know from Kansas is we, we saw a lot of their in-house data and how students were moving through the different SFA levels. We would like to see how that correlates um, to their fast bridge assessment, which is their computerized, I don't like know, mm -hmm. multiple times a year, I believe. Um, we didn't see any of that raw data. So we'd be interested to see within the school year, our kids moving outside of SFA on that nationally normed fast bridge assessment. Yes. So 
on the SFA information, they were showing progress. State showed stagnation. At, okay, but so, minimal so, progress. Minimal, so it still showed some progress. Now, did you feel that the, that information? I mean, I, I, I hear the the superintendent's statement and position fine, but at the same time, I know how. You know, you can take statistics and move them any way you want to make a move. Did you feel that that was producing the results that he was stating or that SFA had, had the ability to maneuver those statistics within that data set? I think the, the factor that plays into this is students are working at a level that is appropriate to them. Okay. So they're working at a reading level that progresses them at their specific speed. That is for their learning, right? Okay. So that doesn't necessarily mean I'm a fourth grader doing a fourth grade level <laughs> curriculum piece. I might be a fourth grader learning um, my, learning about my lagging skills in third grade. Okay. So when I take a when I take a state test, I'm being tested on fourth grade material. So when you look at that data, you'll see that's where the, I think the, the the disconnect between those data pieces are. So we have data that shows growth, but those two sources of data are measuring different things. So with the objective to bring them to grade, grade level, mm -hmm. the state is going to be monitoring where they're at on grade level. Correct. Correct. Whereas the SFA testing is going to be monitoring their internal progress their within growth, the program. Their growth. Mm -hmm. Their growth. Correct. Sorry. I think another thing to keep in mind too is that every state report card looks different. So Kansas state report card is not the same as a Wisconsin state report card. So we were not able, we don't have training in Kansas state report cards. We don't understand what factors and um, determinations are made to get to their final score. Um, but we do understand ours. And, but what we could see in that achievement piece, cause that's kind of more of an apples to apples piece is that we're very similar. We don't know if they're like our state report card factors in growth for students in various levels, depending on your school. We don't know if that's the case in the state of Maine. Do we do um, like the SFA assessments or the fast bridge? Do we do that internally that we can look at our data in the same way? We do not have data like that at the moment. Okay. Is that something that you would find to be helpful if? We didn't get to, so speaking to FastBridge itself, yeah. we did not get to see what that assessment looks like. Okay. Um, to have something that is an internal data set, I guess would be helpful. Okay. You might have just answered my question. So in-house data, how much did you get to dive into that? We didn't, other than their spreadsheet, yeah. which was a spreadsheet showing how the students moved through the different levels. Um, and how many students were below grade level versus how many students were above grade level. But we don't, but there's also input from teachers and they're, they are choosing to place children in those levels. Um, and so there's some human element to it. It's not raw data. Yep. So, uh, but for example, we have all, if you bring a student in that doesn't know English very much at all, and we have a benchmark, can we get extract somehow to prove that they have grown from where they started um, so that we can validate the, uh, the in-house data that it's actually accurate, not it's not the doctors, it's not being you know hyped up. But I think that's that's really what because when you said in-house data and you kind of put quotes, I want to I'm not I understand your, your presentation. So what I'm saying is growth is the biggest thing. Like growth is huge. This is how we this is how I, mean, I understand the state standards are very important. However, if we have a disadvantaged family that comes in the district, they don't have these skills, they have a broken home, they're divorced, they have other things. If they don't know how to read, that's one thing, but they got to start somewhere. And if we can if we can articulate the growth that we can prove it, then, then, then we're here. And then you're saying in-house data, we don't have the matrix on it. We know it's a little subjective because obviously it's the human factor. That's what we all want. We see a student achieve more, they're doing better. You know, so I understand that. I'm not, I'm not all about... I'm about the human factor if we can prove it. So how can we prove that these children are showing growth? That's my question. Yes, yeah, the teachers. What what did the teachers say? I mean, you know, there's obviously a conflict with the with the data. And as Colin said, 
Well, you know, data is data. God manipulated. But what would did you talk to the teachers and did they say, yeah, these kids are really learning to read? I would say yeah, that was yes. that definitely yeah. the over. That was mm-hmm. their overwhelming excitement. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did you match that to our students? We're getting there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sweet. <Yeah. laughs> I don't want to spoil anyone's thunder here. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. <clears throat> All of that taken into consideration. Our questions moving forward is um, how, how are we going to measure that growth versus achievement to the community if it doesn't show up quickly in our state testing? And how are we going to show that to families? I mean, we just touched upon a little bit the instructional component of SFA, and what we just discussed was that the level and the rigor of the lessons are really matching what the student's performance level is at that time. So one of the pieces that we were able to see was it allowed for students to work beyond their grade level, um, and we saw that in one of the K-5 buildings where Sixth or fifth grade students were actually working on some sixth grade curriculum at that time, and that was all laid out for them through the SFA program. We just talked about one of the issues that kind of align. Maybe one of the questions that we have would be how does this match if we are giving the state board assessment? And if students at a third grade level might first be learning first grade material. Then when do they eventually get that fourth grade material? It's going to be after they take that fourth grade assessment. So that is one of the issues that does lie with the SFA program that we have. I mean, one of our shifts in working through if we do implement this in the district would be right now we have a reading proficiency model versus a standard based model. So changes that have access across the whole grade level. So it is a whole mind shift for us. Instead of me right now being a first grade teacher, I could potentially have some second grade students in my classroom as well, maybe some kindergartners as well, just depending on where they're at level wise. So that's a little bit of a mind shift. Uh, um, pause on that one. So as far as if you got kindergartners possibly in a third grade classroom, did, did you see some of that type of stuff where you have young kids? How was the... Uh, I mean, you got to look at mental maturity as well. How did that mental maturity play into that classroom that is we, in that picture? We did witness that in the schools that we were in. Um, one of the schools, they were very solid on making sure that they only deviated one grade level above and one grade level below. Okay. Um, one of the schools was a little bit different than that. We, um, we were in, I believe it was a first grade classroom and they had a fourth grader embedded into that classroom at that time. There was disconnect for that fourth grader. Um, she was a little bit more disengaged with conversations and the learning that was occurring at that time. But we asked that question to the teachers as well as the, as well as the assistant superintendent why that was occurring. We, we didn't like that we saw that, yeah. um, but it was also that student had just come into the district and they weren't really sure of a placement for her. So they put her in there and that really was her level and that's just where she fit in at that time. But on the flip side, one of the classrooms that we were in was a first grade classroom and maybe a third I think it was a, yes, I think here. There was a first grade classroom we went into and there was a third grade student embedded in there and I know that Anna did ask that student how they felt and their quote was, I, I like it because I'm, I'm learning. learning. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there it's, it's two case goals, case, right? Guess, and, yeah. Right. And um, so there's different ways it would, again, that was one of our <clears throat> questions would be is if the district were to implement SFA, what direction would we go with it? Um, where would our cutoff be in that deviation for grade levels? And there too was a little bit different because their kinding, which is one of our questions later on, their kindergarten program was completely separated from the first through fifth grade classroom. So the, the kindergarten program, which we really didn't have a lot of explanation, was its own identity. Kind of, kind of like what we used to do at Riverview when everyone was at the one school. You mean they're, they're still in the mixed schools, but they basically have like a full day 
um, programming okay. versus the 90 minute block that's focused on reading. Yeah. So they kind of had a different little schedule for the little the little ones. And the way that this worked there too is the way they could share their students was the scheduling component where their times all matched so they could shift to students. Okay. For discussion purposes, can you just do hypothetical with you? Say we have a new student coming from the district up to white and comes here and they're uh, they're they're just they're a little bit behind. What are we what's the process that we're doing right now? Um we assess them obviously and then are we gonna put them in uh the grade level that they were told or can you walk through that with me and then tell me the differences that we could possibly do if we have an SFA program? Uh, I can't, we can't answer what we would do in an SFA program. Okay, we can we say can we can do what we do now. Right now, a student, if they're an incoming second grader and they so have lagging, fourth okay, incoming fourth grader with lagging skills, yep. they still enter a fourth grade classroom and we do separate intervention to build up those okay. lagging skills. Okay. And do they present how they would, obviously, they said one grade level, they would try to. It depends, it varied from school to school. Mm -hmm. So that's the discretion of. Superintendent, okay. or, yeah, that's huge, though. And that question that you're asking how much would we go laterally to make the achievement so that it meets where they're at, meet them where they're at to, to get them to start achieving? That's that's a very important question, and it's it's, it's almost on a case to case, case basis or the, the, the problem that they're having, or but that's that's a standard that we're going to have to decide if we would implement this. Great question, that's, a, that's something we're going to have to wrestle with. Thank you for that question. Well, what's what's the downside of doing that, though? I mean, I'm just trying to think through this, and I I would think if you had someone that wasn't able to read at the grade level, that they'd probably be more comfortable learning at a pace that they're they could do it. I mean, I'm just trying to envision the other side. I guess they probably wouldn't be crazy about maybe being with younger kids, but to your point, what we're doing now, how do they feel if there's like a separate intervention? You know, I guess we're not knowing what that looks like now. I think either way, they're they're getting. The individual attention of right? Yeah, I think it would. I think it depends on that individual child and how they feel. Um, so it was. It was clear the disconnect and uh, with a, so in that first classroom with first graders, there was a fourth grader and a second grader that was in there, and the fourth grader and second grader were teamed up together. Uh, you could tell that there was not the same dynamic between them and the other students. Um, the other classroom it didn't seem as big of a, a dynamic shift. So the one student that I said, hey, is this normally your classroom that you're in or do you switch? And she's the whole table that we were at. They're like, oh, we switch, we all, we all of us come in here for our reading. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Do you like switching? And they said, yeah. And then I just asked the question, why do you like switching? And uh, one of them said they liked having different teachers. And another one said, I like coming in here because I'm learning, I feel like I'm learning. So, and I think that was the testament of, I'm learning what I need in that moment. So it, it varies from child to child. And I think that that would be no matter what curriculum we use and what format we use, we have to consider the children. So I wanna just define that, I would call that inclusion of when I went to college and what I was taught to be an educator of having the student in the classroom, but the appropriate classroom. Um, that's what I would define that as, we did that or change the title of what we call that now of a student that is in that. Otherwise, would you be pulling that student out? Do they pull that student out and go to a different room? <laughs> That's what I'm asking. No, our teachers can do interventions right within their no. workshop model. Yep. So we're doing out. that in the classroom right now, and they were doing that as well in Kansas. Um, so when you are grouped in your reading group, yes, that's what I'm asking. All different teach so like students are um they're tracked in an area that they, like they're getting the level of reading curriculum that they need at that moment. So uh, let me just put it in like number six. So I'm a first grader and I'm in first grade level semester. I'm in a level that's within the first grade year semester yep. one, okay? And I'm grouped with all a bunch of other kids that need that same level. That in makes that sense? Same classroom. Yep, and then every quarter, they Reset. take assessment data and reassess to see do we need to shift students and shift teachers and what they're teaching. And how are we doing that right now? Are we doing that? No. Yeah. That's right. my question. Yeah. Okay. That's my okay. Question. Thank you. I'm like, what am I missing here? Well, all right. Because I'm hearing cooperative learning. I'm hearing 
grade level appropriate. I'm hearing moving one grade level to, to achieve the achievement, to find where their needs are, and then grow them up. And I'm asking, what's the disconnect of what we're doing in Manitowoc to what they're doing there? That's what that's so what we're doing. Grade level material with yeah, interventions, interventions, interventions. and yeah. small groups. I would say so the mini lesson would be on the grade level standards. Mm -hmm. The small group instruction that happens for the bulk of the workshop time is kids meeting on the skills that they need, and teachers are running lots of different small groups in a given day and then throughout the week um, with kids at varied levels. You can have kids from a kindergarten level to a fifth grade level in a fifth grade classroom potentially right now. This is all kids at the same level are moving to classroom A. All kids at this level would move to classroom B. Which so that's gonna, kind of the difference. Which was going to be my question about it from a from a classroom teacher perspective. Is this? I mean, I all I often hear that it's very difficult to do all this di differential learning um, in in the one classroom. So is this model helpful for that because you're not doing all the different differential? It's already done in oh, the classroom teachers. <laughs> it, yes, because you're teaching one specific group of students who are majority at the same level okay. for the whole 90 minutes. Got it. I have a, uh, the stuff I'm reading is saying that Success for all is, is pretty rigid, very scripted, you know, micromanaged. Um, you know, I mean, they'll catch you on a comma if you, if you speak like that. And um, well, what you were saying about what we do now in the Manitoba public schools is there's a flexibility there for some kind of judgment decision to be made by people who are working with the kids. It, would that be possible under the success for all thing, or is it just like, boy, you know, you get in your stall and you just do it, you know. Um, I mean, I, I think that, I'm, having been a teacher myself, you know, that, that that's some flexibility for the different needs of different kids. And the flexibility in terms of how a teacher communicates to kids, not just in the mass, but, you know, individually. I, I worry about the inflexibility in the regimentation. So what, what what did you see in terms of that? I, we did see um, that they that Kansas had a little bit of flexibility with with some things. Okay. They did not they were not able to deter from the um, materials or the trade books and things like that that they worked with. But for example, if a student um, just <clears throat> It needs consistency, and that changing of a teacher each quarter might affect them. That it, that's taken into consideration, right? Mm -hmm. That they, and, and that's what we had observed in Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, as far as teachers, they comment they commented that they didn't need supplementing or supplemental materials um, for that ninety minute block. One of the rooms I went into was a kindergarten classroom and I asked exactly the same question you asked mm -hmm. her and she said she was hired after their school year had begun and she said the most crucial part for her was the PD training that came right from the SFA trainers themselves which was just a one-day training she said that she was able to pick up that manual and just start teaching but now that she's been in into it how many months she said she's been able to deviate away from it oh, to a degree, but yet there's still the fidelity there that they have to teach within those materials. And she said it, she's been in other districts before and felt very comfortable picking it right up. And it wasn't, it, when you look at the materials, the curriculum, it does look very scripted, but she said it was easy for her to follow coming in. Okay. Moving on to literacy skill level, um, we were looking at the levels of the kids. Or one of our categories we talked about was um, literacy, literacy skills. Yeah. So students at grade level demonstrated a stronger literacy skill set than the majority of our students and PSC students working at the same grade levels. So we saw things like um, being able to construct complete sentences and uh, um, regularly cite text evidence to support their thinking. Right. Oh, wow. 
So that was good. Um, we also saw that students had many opportunities to share their responses um, in to text, um, both in writing and orally. So they were doing both writing, responding to the text, as well as verbally speaking that. Um, all students were expected to have a response and um, be prepared to share if they were called on. So that was a positive as well. Um, students seemed to be on board with that and ready to go. Um, and they spoke in complete sentences, just like they were expected to write in complete sentences. So the drawbacks to the, liter the, the literacy skills, um, we noticed that students had less minimal opportunities for independent reading and writing outside of what was determined um, by the curriculum. So, and the SFA component, writing component that they used in Kansas um, was lacking, especially in grammar. So they opted in on the writing program and decided, and we're using that as well, and it seemed to be lacking some things. So also um, students had limited free choice in their reading. We observed students could check out books from the library, two books, one would be on their level and then one would be of their choice. And they, could, they had these books next to them in many of the classes and could read those when they completed their other work during the day, take them home. Um, so they did have opportunities to select books. We just didn't see a lot of that independent reading time implemented in the class time. Did you think that, that some of that was driven by um, library policy or SFA policy? I think it was a, a school, a school, school decision. School decision. So it was just kind of one of those things that that school had decided and we could obviously pivot off that block. They actually had a, one of their specials was a library special. So when they, they had a library special, so they had multiple times a week mm -hmm. to go to the yeah. library and actually yeah. choose books and oh. check out books. And one of the items that I noticed observing in all three sites, their classroom libraries looked very minimal and it could have just been a Kansas component. Um, whereas I think our district has a plethora of books yeah. in classrooms. Right. So it just might be the readiness and the neediness that they have. So kids were actually reading independently because they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a pretty good sign. Yeah. 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 That was the they had chosen to supplement. That was SFA writing. Okay. Yeah. So they used the SFA writing component. They added that in. Mm -hmm. And so we would obviously, if you know, we're not going to tolerate, you know, that we would probably we could find something that would be a little better. You're leading me to our question. Our question is, what will we supplement with as a writing curriculum? Right. Uh, can I? Uh, you talked a little bit about checking out books. Is there a homework component of the Absolutely. reading? Absolutely. Because oh. I wanted to hear about that. If, if you're going to mention it later, you can read, or there's something you want to say. I don't know. Really 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 um, they had a sheet. It was mandatory, expected at, I think, all of the schools. Oh, yes. yep. um, it was a small form that went home. And basically, for K through two, it was the parents' sign off that they read, and the kids maybe write two words from their read for reading. Um, and so in third grade, they had actually modified that to be more, a little bit more writing. Um, but it was 10 minutes a night and it was expected. And they actually had celebrations for the kids who had 80%, 80 percent of reading during each quarter. And they had celebrations. Um, one thing I really liked also was that at Westside, um, which is a school on like Jefferson, we saw that. For those kids that don't have the support at home to get that done, the kids could come in 20 minutes early and somebody could sign off for them in the morning if they read it at school in the morning. And I thought that was amazing. And they had the reading homework was only Monday through Friday. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, uh, I'll come back to the inside. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about programming, which we kind of have touched on a bit. Um, we observe direct instruction. Um, so the direct instruction during that SFA block provided a focus lesson for all students with very known expectations and routines for their learning. Um, we watched a lot of cooperative time, um, partner readings, some very explicit expectations. The kids knew exactly what to do. Um, and based on that direct instruction that they received. Um, a, a Kansas question we still have is, while we were there, not knowing what pieces of SFA that they were implementing to the program fidelity. Like we were not sure what might they be doing in response to student and staff needs versus um, what is within the, the suggested FF, SFA model. Um, so we, we still need to understand what SFA fidelity looks like. Um, within that programming, some of those considerations that we need to be wary of is the elementary schedule. Um, length of a specials block, how many special students have each week, how often do PLCs occur. Um, Kansas had a really nice schedule and their students um, participated in a six day cycle of specials. And within that, they, the teachers essentially had 60 minutes every day of prep. Um, and then three times during that six day cycle, they got an additional 30 minutes of prep based on how they organized their schedule. So that prep was not just individual prep, it was PLC, team prep, intervention work, those kinds of things. Um, and we, we definitely schedule is a big, a big thing. I remember my question now, I'm sorry. Um, so I had a parent that's con had voiced his concerns about his daughter not getting enough homework in the district. And I wanna know what our district policy is right now, district-wide about reading homework or among other homework. Do we have something like that in place? Thank you for your question. I was going to talk a little bit more about programming. We've discussed most of this already as far as, yes, it is very sequential, very systematic. Um, we saw that as a benefit for kids. There was never a question as to what are we going to do in reading today or what comes next. They seem to benefit from that. Um, we did discuss as a district, what are our cutoffs going to be? Are we gonna allow a fourth grader in a first grade room? Um, as you mentioned, Matt, yeah, I'm the ELL teacher, like, yes, right? So we've reason. got an eighth grade newcomer come in who's just beginning English. Are we sending that student to a first grade level group? Mm -hmm. um, also touching on what you asked, Tony, um, it was Lori Williams explained this to me once in a very wonderful way. Just because you can't do your math facts doesn't mean you can't do fourth grade geometry, getting exposed to your grade level curriculum. Um, some of our students who maybe can't read at that eighth grade <clears throat> level still can infer about characters, follow a story arc, um, learn some of that grade level material. So that's one of our big district questions is how are we going to balance grade level material, and kind of those SFA. I picture them as bins. <laughs> you are in second grade semester one bin or sixth grade semester two bin. Um, Did you get any answers about that at all from their administration or their teachers? How they're taking on those challenges well, of a transfer student or of an English language student? So we observed multiple English language students in those lower, um, what they're called groups, classes, the, the first grade level classes. I in, I did not see any students who had arrived within the last two years. I did not see any newcomer students. Although we were told they have some from the Marshall Islands, I did not meet with any of those students. Also, another big piece of that is they do not run SFA at their middle school. 
in Kansas. So um, I guess to that then, is there a plan, and that was a question that I had written down here, are there any plans to implement further? Because obviously they returned to it in 2020. Is there any plans to re-implement or re-engage at that middle school level? No. 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 Okay. And what was the, did you hear any rationale behind that? Yes. I don't remember what it was. He, he said that their middle school was doing standards-based grading and showing success. And I believe his words were, we don't want to mess with a good thing, I think is what he said. I think it's also important to note they did not offer preschool. Okay. They had no preschools there. So how would that, uh, I guess, I, mean, I mean, might not be picking up the, the, but if they're not offering preschool, how would that correlate to the middle school aspects then? I guess I'm just. I'm saying they're not offering middle school if they're not offering preschool. Oh, Same gotcha. I understand. Okay. Right. And so what we saw in kindergarten class was based on four months of development. And I, he did, the superintendent did allude to the fact that if they are implementing SFA now, one of the reasons why they don't need to have it at the middle school level is because you are filling in the gaps earlier. And hopefully by the time they transition over to the middle school level, those gaps are more filled than what they would be and didn't need as much of the SFA component, but they might need the differentiation component built in. And that kind of segues me into the next question. Um, we just had professional development last week on the science of reading. SFA does match with the science of reading, um, especially in the kinder and the roots curriculum. So those would be your lowest part of the curriculum um, pieces. One of our lingering questions would be, which I discussed earlier, is that the kinder corner is a full day implementation that's run a little bit different than the one through five component. So how does that work? How would that work in our district, especially when we talked about the scheduling component at the elementary level, because they all kind of do cycle together. Um, one of our work throughs in the district would be if the district were to implement this, would we do SFA to its fidelity or would the district start putting its own twist on things, taking out some components, would we reinsert some components we need to supplement the writing? The writing is a little bit weaker. Are we going to put in our kinder classes a little bit differently? So all of those, the it, it, it really comes all together to the professional development, the staffing um, components, the, the scheduling is, is huge um, wonder before we could even think about moving forward with it, that puzzle. Okay, so um, talking about literacy grouping, um, the SFA reading block had smaller groups of kids, which we really liked. It was 10 to 12 kids per room with a teacher. Um, that was a positive. Um, Maybe <laughs> We were unable to observe, however, we were unable to observe special education classrooms, and we are concerned about how those are run. We want to understand how they're running it and um, what, the, what the students in special education are doing. Um, we did see that some of the special education students were within groups, but um, within, within SFA groups. Um, but there were others that were not, and so we're not quite sure. So one of so we have a couple of populations of students that differ in our in our district. Um, they did have a severe ID program, but they said that their severe ID students are not um, participating in the SFA. They have a they kind of just do the programming related to what those students need in the moment. Um, both of us have an EBD severe population in our buildings as well, but they did not have that. We. We did not see that population of students in Kansas. So those are questions that we talk about. Another question was, with the smaller groups for reading, we're wondering about space and staffing. Because that would be phenomenal. That's one of the keys that makes it work, in my opinion. But how are we going to staff and have the space for all of those smaller groups? Small class sizes has been talked about for since I was a kid that, hey, that's great. 
But I think it then comes into the reality of how to make those things happen. And so that, yeah, I'm glad that you touched on that. It's how do you do that? We want it to happen. You're right. Yeah, I get it. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> Which leads us to our next area, and that's staffing. Um, we love that we observed um, that all staff take responsibility for all students um, and their learning, not just their own classroom of students. So there was definitely everyone on board, everyone together. Um, with that being said, um, one of the schools had their specials teachers, art, music, and PE teaching SFA groups, the reading block time. Um, this just didn't seem to be best practice for students, nor the best use of the skill set of those specials teachers. Um, three of the other schools did not use that model. That was used in the smallest school um, just for a more hands on deck approach um, to, to get more groups, um, which leads us to here in Manitowoc, how do we ensure the transition of implementation to SFA will not impede our current staffing supports? For example, associate principals, dean of students, self-contained teachers, counselors, all, all of those positions. Um, for time's sake, I would <laughs> like to recommend that we gave you the copy of the document. So if you want to just kind of go through our other pros and cons mm -hmm. and questions, so I would recommend you doing that as the board. Um, but then I think I would love to be able to turn this over to our Ohio friends who I'm sure would love to tell you about Ohio well. Anything else you guys want to highlight quickly before you move on? And if not, you can also send us a message too. <laughs> I would say if, if we could do it the way Kansas was doing it, um, like we were seeing really good things, but like that means that we can somehow ensure we have the rooms, we have the staff, there's 10 to 12 in a room, we have the schedule. The special so, so, component would change the way elementary school, the elementary school teachers are feeling, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. We would have a more comparable um, amount of time for prep as the older, the higher grades, and right now we're feeling crushed. So mm -hmm. I would really love, personally, if you would consider <laughs> you know, that one special of, one, one of the concerns that people have voiced is, you know, the the the, the elective courses, the music and the guard and the, you know, the triad and stuff like that. Is the schedule, how long a day do they have? Yeah. I mean, with 90 minute, 90 minute class sessions, they have an uh, hour a day for specials. They have an hour a day minutes. for specials. Okay. Um, it's a six day rotation. They have five specials in their school. So RP and music, same as what we have. They also add in library and computers. Okay. Um, in that six day rotation. So art is always a 60 minute block because they need oh, a longer yeah. time oh, for okay. um, working on art projects. The other ones they split into 30 minute chunks. Um, so they always have that hour time. That hour time is common across a grade level. So that's when teachers can have that collaborative time for e with each other to do PLC work, um, have IEP meetings, things like that, where you might have to have multiple people in a room together. The extra time, that extra 30 minute chunk that happens three out of the six days in their rotation is not the same across grade levels. You might have teacher A has it here, teacher B down here, um, but they're also getting, so three of the six days, they actually have 90 minutes for specials. Okay, so you're saying that electives don't have to wither away, sort of. That. Correct. We saw a very different model than what they saw when they went to Ohio. Okay. With, as far as specials. Okay. As far as a six day and a five day, so you have five days in a week, you're running a six day schedule. How does that translate to continuity? And that kind of is like, I mean, I, I guess I'm picturing it as rotating schedules. That's one of the things, even in professional life, I mean, adults, they don't like that. I mean, so how do we have uh, a continuity in schedule for the, the children and are we getting that across 
when we're rotating on a day to day and it's moving along like that? How does we that already happen? have that. So we yeah. have an ABC schedule right now. So we have a three day schedule in a five day week. So you already so have it's already a process it's already happening already and kids and, yeah. roll with it. Right. <laughs> I Thank think you. the, the biggest thing for me would just be as the board is to look at the importance of do you want readers or are you going to be looking at the assessment, the state board exam score. So that's where the differentiation piece comes in because it, it's you're looking at two different sets of data with this. So I'll leave you with that. That's a good point. Okay. Thank, appreciate you. You. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank Yes, if we can go ahead and have a thing up, come up that went to Ohio. And if you can just highlight things that you may have seen there. We were really fortunate in Ohio to be able to send um, some of our pre k teachers. So it's a different thing that we were looking at. And it was one of the areas that um, I had asked Heidi to zero in on that. Because in Ohio, I didn't get to see the elementary. That's why I wanted to see it in Kansas. But... So if you guys want to introduce yourselves and maybe tell them what role you play right now in the district. Do you have a special name though for your group too? Like the chicken, <laughs> chicken I fried chicken? No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it could be the small group. Okay, I'm Heidi Shorters. I'm the principal at Riverview. Uh, Kelsey Morrow, fourth grade teacher at Riverview. Um, I'm Jenny Kill and I'm our early learning coordinator. I want to let Jenny start. And then when you're done, I think I can you can but then we'll just really highlight what's different yes. from what you heard. Absolutely. So um, after hearing the first group had gone to Ohio, um, many had come back reporting that they had a preschool for SFA and it was magical. Um, so I was glad to get the opportunity since that's my, my jam uh, for our district right now. Um, so I would say right out of the gates, it was very evident that uh, the stupid mill school district really put a lot of their um, worth and money and effort into their um, earliest learners. Um, they had full day 3K, uh, 4K uh, transitional kindergarten um, and kindergarten um, within their elementary school. Um, their 3 and 4K were in mixed classrooms. Um, the pre-K curriculum was very play-based, uh, but not just all free play, it was purposeful play uh, based on different developmental domains, uh, very data focused. There was a very strong uh, component that had to do with oral language and vocabulary. Um, and those elements were taught in um, two week themes uh, within the 4K classrooms. Um, I should say preschool classrooms, because again, they were mixed age. Again, uh, this district, was very different than what I'm hearing about Kansas. They have been at this for 20 years and you've all heard this already, um, but mm -hmm. they knew what they were doing and everyone knew their purpose and why. And it, it was impressive, um, very data focused. So not only are they measuring the academic pieces, they were measuring uh, the student's achievement in oral language, which I thought was a, a very nice piece for early childhood because that's the foundation uh, for success moving forward. Um, in reading. Um, their, the makeup of their preschool was uh, a little bit different and I think that had to do with a lot about their state requirements, um, but they really were really uh, strong in the sense that they would not let their children fail um, in those early years and they weren't able to move them forward unless they were successful um, to go to kindergarten and to first grade. So they put a lot of their um, strength into their early learning. So that was my lens. And um, I did ask some tough questions in regards to um, why, you know, we, we don't have that in this program here um, in Wisconsin. Um, and I would say that the one concern for me was just cost and sustainability. Um, and the answer that we received from their, their principal was that um, it's, the, it's the very best. And, um, they, she, she said, uh, if you really want to get the outcomes, you have to put the money for it. So that was my, my biggest concern, just knowing that it's expensive. So she said, money districts don't do it because it's expensive. 
but they're putting that money in early on so that the gap is is um, prevented before the gap even starts. Yeah, just um, adding to Jenny, um, with concerns, some conversations that we've been having were just, are, it's one thing to be able to afford to implement it, but can we then sustain it for years to come? Um, okay, um, so the Kansas team, they talked a lot, um, about a lot of things that we had saw in Ohio as well. Um, starting with, we were really impressed with the collaboration that we saw in the classrooms. Um, students were engaged, they were working together in teams, so they had partnerships and then um, a team level that they worked on as well. And students knew their roles um, and they seemed motivated working in these teams. Um, because there was also a positive reinforcement piece um, that they then celebrate at the end of each of their blocks. I think we should demonstrate some of that. <laughs> this was evidenced in the early learning too. I, they, these children were cheering each other on and when the teacher saw something that deserved to be celebrated, they were celebrating it together through, you know? Oh, what did shine, they say? Shine, shine your halo. halo. And then my favorite was the, um, the Home Alone, Home Alone um, one was the best. So they would go, it was a shh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they have cut, you know. Hold on. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was a little bit concerned, like, oh, I hope I get to see all these really fun things. And the kids were engaged and they all knew and they got to come up with their own cheers with their peers. So that was impressive. Um, another thing I think we were really impressed with was the consistency across the school. So um, I, I think the last group touched on this again, that the expectation was for students to be prepared to be called on. So we didn't see a ton of hands being raised. There were, um, teachers had, so, Aprons. aprons that they wore with sticks so um the kids didn't know when they were going to be called on so they had to be prepared um so that and just the overall use of instructional time it seemed like there were was not much time wasted well oiled machine <laughs> yes for sure some things some things that i from that were different for sure would be they have actually an hour less of a school day than we have, which was really surprising to me. Um, their specials block was only half an hour, so teachers had only about half an hour for prep. We talked, we asked about that. We we were really lucky because the they had two um, coaches at that building because their principal was like 500 kids in the school, and their principal also had district administration responsibilities, so sometimes she would leave. So they did two coaches um, that supported the principal in lots of ways. Um, but they spent the whole day with us and they took us from classroom to classroom um, and they answered any question that we had. Um, it was, it was when we asked about that only half an hour, the teachers all ate lunch with us. So they rotated in and out um, during the lunchtime and then we got to ask them any questions that we wanted. And when we asked about that, they said, because so much of the curriculum is prepared for you, you're not scrambling for resources. You are not running and figuring something out because it's here for you. So they don't need as much prep as how they felt. And again, they've been doing it for 20 years. They don't have a lot of staff turnover. Um, some other differences would be um, that they did not have children, not at their grade level. So you would never see a second grader in a kindergarten classroom or a fourth grader in a first grade classroom that was their school was no way on that um they did have um their kids broken up so this the harder it was for a kid to succeed the lower the number of kids were in that room so in the first grade they had maybe what would be three homeroom teachers that broke out into five first grade sections and so the first grade section that we saw that was probably the most challenged learners, they only had eight students in that room. 
the first grade classroom that we went in, that was the students that were above target, there were 24 kids in that room. And so um, that was pretty consistent across all the grades. So the more support you needed, the more support you got. Um, they did that also, I just wanted to mention that the kindergarten 3K, 4K, they stay in their room all day, so they don't do any switching around. So your kindergartners are with the same teacher all day. Um, and they, they were engaged in a lot of things that we currently do in our 4K classrooms. Uh, some of the play, I mean, play is a method of learning, right? And it's an instructional tool. So they're learning labs. They have eight learning labs at um, various tables. And the theme that they were working on was winter. So if they were working on fine motor um, in one activity, they had painters tape all over the, the bin and they had walled up paper underneath and they had tweezers and they're working on their fine motor strength, trying to get those snowballs out and almost like operational, like you can't touch the tape. Um, so very fun, very play-based and um, purposeful in the fact that they're working on the whole child within those learning labs. And outside of that, they still had what I would consider balanced literacy um, with uh, shared reading and interactive reading, um, very engaged. They had a puppet named Curiosity. Um, the preschool curriculum is uh, Curiosity Corner. Um, so Curiosity is the name of the cat. Um, so it was playful, um, which I think is appropriate for our little ones and super important. There was also social, emotional, and math embedded in their curriculum. Uh, Currently, we do several different pieces, so it was one piece in the package. Anything else coming? Um, <clears throat> in, at this particular school, they also had a supplemental writing and um, ELA curriculum that focused on phonics mm -hmm. and grammar. Because um, we had some questions about what do you do about the holes um, or the lack of writing curriculum. Um, so they had another curriculum in addition to that. Um, and then uh, our Kansas um, school, they also talked about that there was not quite as much um, of a focus on individual choice reading. Um, and we would agree we saw the same thing in Ohio. Um, we almost essentially saw no classroom libraries, which was um, a bit of a shift for us. Um, and it seems as we um, we saw that the kids are working at the, are on these texts in their classrooms, um, so there's not as much focus on their <coughs> choice. So that was kind of a concern for us, um, just because we thought um, we don't want to take away the enjoyment of reading and having that choice and finding a love for reading. So that was a bit of a concern for us. Did you witness any children playing on their phones or behavior or hopeless while you guys were there? No, but I did ask the question, where are the chair throwers? That's what I would ask. She did ask that question, and she said they're not at the school. Okay. And so, and so, but I will also tell you, I have never seen the level of engagement. And there were kids that were squirming in their chairs, you know, that no, wasn't like we were in Pleasantville, but they definitely, the kids were so engaged and I have, I've never seen the level of engagement and we saw in every classroom that we were in. Um, I am going to go on a little bit of a rant and just say, I went in there probably more with a closed heart than an open heart. Um, I went through a transformation over the course of the day, but the reason was I could not get past the success. Every room we went in, like the kids were outperforming our kids by at least, you know, I would say two grade levels or more with what they were able to do and with their writing. And I don't know how you argue with that in the sense of it was a very high poverty school and we just saw an awful lot of success and was a little confused, but you know, that it, that's what we saw. Thank you for being so honest. Are you, were they using, what writing program were they using? Were they using I, I don't know, uh, but they did. So I have like a schedule in front of me of one of the teachers. And so in addition to their 90 minute reading block, this teacher also has a half an hour in the afternoon for spelling, a half, a half an hour for um, language and a half an hour for handwriting. So 
their schedule has a lot of literacy in the afternoon in addition to that 90 minute reading block. <clears throat> I don't have the name written down either. They just have an outside, yeah, writing curriculum. Colin, did you guys uh, touch on the? Or did you guys ask? Why, I mean, I, one of the things that we both both groups have said um, that the the classroom libraries mm -hmm. it, was that a, you guys did you guys ask why they don't have those at all? Or it seems bizarre to me too because I mean I grew up with those too. I, we do have an answer to that, but you're not, no one's going to like the answer, I don't think. So okay. their school was super full. Like they were using every space. The, the office conference room actually was where the transition kindergarten class was. So they were maximizing every possible place. They don't have a library. They're using their library as instruction space. So that doesn't mean we would have to do that. I mean, I think we're, we're all pretty passionate about reading boxes and kids having choices and going to the library. So. You know, whatever SFA that is, SFA. I don't that was that not was an SFA choice. thing. It was just that the, was the what they were choice. able to, right. the means that they had to yeah, make yeah. this happen. Okay. And they have an hour or less school day. Maybe the parents can take them to the library. Okay. Um, <laughs> another one that I had, uh, special needs. Um, that has been a concern about some parents that have reached out to us. Um, concern of mine as well as, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for the rest of the book. Well, I'm sure everybody here, how did they manage that? So we, so they have, um, their special education students are incorporated into the classroom in the morning for the reading and the math block. And then in the afternoon, that's when they would have their special ed pullout. So they still have that special ed pullout that we, we offer students if it's part of their IEP, um, but all students were part of the regular education morning. Yeah. And then there were, um, Specialized teachers that were running certain block, um, like classrooms. Mm -hmm. So then those they would teach the special students. teachers would teach reading in the morning, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a special ed class. It was a inclusion, like kids of all, <laughs> right. all abilities yeah. that were putting into that block. And did they have individuals that you know? I mean, obviously, because like some individuals, maybe that might not work for as well. You know, I, but I mean, I'm not in that section. You guys might you know better than me, but. Would that be something that we could do in that regard too? I think that our goal is to have our our special education students in the regular education environment as much as we possibly can. So I really liked it yeah. that the kids were incorporated in the whole reading and math block. And one thing I think that made that successful is so again I went in with that early learning focus. Uh, they had aids in all of their uh, 4K classrooms and in their, in their kindergarten classrooms. Uh, I know that the kindergarten uh, aides also uh, were tutors, I believe, in the afternoon, primarily in first grade. So they really did put their efforts into the, the youngest kids. So, for example, would you see a classroom with multiple lessons going on at the same time with, uh, um, we'll call it a teacher, a teacher here, is there going to be an aide helping another two groups of kids? No. So um, was it, it was only one teacher to help. Okay. One or two groups, or can you explain that to me a little bit? Do you understand? What I'm, I'm going to separate from that the early childhood piece, yeah. the 3K to 5K, because their curriculum is very different. Yep. So I'm going to do a job on that. Uh, there were no aids in um, first grade through fifth grade in the classroom. We saw that only in kindergarten. So it was just a teacher and a group of kids. But again, you've got those lower numbers, not always. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't think there was a need for an aid to be well, honest with you. Numbers, yeah. 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 So, but could you um, could you fathom being uh, we have nice big classrooms in some of these schools? Obviously, could you have uh, two two bins of, uh, of one lesson and then two bins of another lesson in the same room? So, I don't think so. I think you would just use your bigger rooms for your larger groups and your smaller rooms for your smaller groups. I would say no to that. So part of um, I had asked because one of the things that I had heard is that. The curriculum is outdated so i had asked about the updates um and how often it's <laughs> updated um, and the at least the preschool to the kindergarten teacher they had told me that it was recently updated and one of the pieces that was integrated was um, their interactive whiteboard um so i'm thinking if you're in one room i don't know of a classroom we have that has two interactive whiteboards so i would say no to that and all of the teacher teachers were using yes that's an integral piece of so the, the, the Ohio the Ohio school 
Do they also include middle school? And did you see any of that? Or we did not visit. Them. We did not visit the middle school. Okay. But they, they just at the elementary school. Do, do, yes. but, our first, did, uh, but our first group did. Yeah. The first group yeah. did. Yeah. 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 You, had a, you had a concern about sustainability um, for this. Um, as far as the sustainability of the program, I mean, I guess what was the what was the reasoning that brought that as a concern? What would be something that you saw as a sustainability? I think, I think this goes back to that question that we had asked them: Why is SFA not as widely used? Um, and they said the cost. So they said they mentioned the upfront cost to implement it, but then they said also to sustain it in the years to come. So again, if is this something we can continue yeah. to afford? Understandable. For yeah. years to come. And part of that is they have reproducibles that we would need to purchase. So some of the books that they are using in their lessons, students have the opportunity to take that copy home and it's a colored paper copy book. Um, so those are the those items that are a cost to well, every year. Year. There it and is. The consumables. Yeah. 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 The trade book originally is 300000 and the initial cost to implement the program, but it really breaks out of, of, <laughs> of the trade yeah. book. So, but it, it's a pretty detailed. It falls off dramatically, obviously, after the first two years, in my opinion, of cost. Well, thank you, James. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you. Um, this, this way. I think it's an old term. Long term. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. 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 Is discussion here. So the first one here is we would uh, there's a, a recommendation to um, eliminate the director of buildings and grounds um, position. Do I have a motion and a second for that? I'll make a motion. I have a second. I'll second it. Okay. Any discussion on that? Uh, what can we talk about right now in open session? Um, I would just say the, the position in general. Yeah, the position. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr. File, what's the rationale for the remaining position? Well, what we're doing here you know, in terms of it, we're looking in the building and grounds categories. We're eliminating two positions, replacing it once, so we're combining it. Um, we're also moving stuff closer to, to the building levels regarding the custodial staff will be uh, the provision of that will be with the principal with the assistance of a new uh, manager position. Okay, so, so we're combining uh, some of this. Uh, it's also going to report uh, um, uh, uh, under Angela, you know, so we're sharing some of that responsibility, um, you know, including the development of a long range plan. So, you know, we're, we're looking in terms of um, having this not a central office position, you know, in terms of it's going to be located, you know, um, you know, with our maintenance, uh, you know, people. Uh, and, and we expect, you know, that there will be a lot of effort in terms of working with schools uh, to take this on, but it's also going to be under um, Angela. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, I'm a little concerned about this because, you know, most of our buildings are old. And there's some really major sorts of problems, as for example, at, at Washington Middle School, you know, with them. And, and I'm, I mean, I'm really, really think we need to insist that we have a long term program to, to triage the problems because we're not, we're not going to have enough money, you know, any year or any two years to fix most of the stuff that needs to be fixed. But I think this. We need a planning. We need a really an important planning component of this. If we're going to just, you know, get rid of the director and then have the have the person that we hire be kind of a day to day a day to day, -day uh, supervisor essentially. Um, so that to me says, well, 
we're going to have to do nexus, I think, if we want to have a long term, a long term, affordable, you know, well organized sort of maintenance program to maintain the buildings that we have and make sure the, the facilities are working. Uh, you know, because I think the supervisory stuff will be like, you know, fixing fixing the toilets and you know and 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 doing you know day to day kind of stuff. So I don't I can't remember what Nexus is is what their bill is, but it seems to me we may not save any money on this. Um, we may we may save some money. I, I I don't know what that that looks like at this point, but that I'm really concerned for the the maintenance of the of the of the buildings and the grounds for the long term. I mean I just hate like hell to see, you know, Lincoln High School slip down the hill. Um, so um, I, I think we have to talk about that. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, uh, I think we have a kind of an incomplete proposal here. So, it, and I guess, I'm, so as far as the uh, scope that Angela would operate under, um, as far as a report, is that just simply a reporting aspect? And then we look at the financials and then it, it, my it's understanding to this is then that, that the manager of the buildings, they're not, they're not going out and doing the work. They're kind of the facilitator of the work. Is this my understanding correct? I've been working very closely with head custodians in terms of what other needs are, you know, for those assignments okay. back, having somebody, you know, very involved in the trades all around, you know, to understand some of this purpose. Uh, the restructuring in terms of putting it under Angela is seeing a bigger picture in terms of the recognition of what Carrie is exactly talking about. We see this as a very important critical component um, you know, that we have to have a long range plan. We have assembled you know, some stuff already um, you know, towards that. Um, Angela's played a key role even you know, up to this day. Um, there will be some transitional <laughs> effort to assist whether or not we might find ourselves going back out for supplemental help to you know, get something in that we can maintain them you know, regarding that assessment long range facility plan. Um, but, um, you know, right now working back through some of our principles and stuff like this, um, I think it's a plan that that will work. Um, uh, it'll be a customer focus, uh, but with the component, uh, Gary, that we do need, you know, a long range facility plan, you know, even though we prioritize a lot of our work in terms of what's critical. Um, you know, so we will be still moving in that direction for that outcome. I, I think that's critical. Any other discussion? <laughs> we, did, we did kick the can on Nexus, right? When are we going to revisit that here next year or this year at some point? You know, I think that, that you know, um, that that's always an option, you know, for us in terms of as we regroup and get this and see what we have right now, you know, to the extent of making sure, you know, uh, you know, our operating referendum that we have right now is just increasing it a little bit so that we are recognizing that we do see some some projects that have to be done now, you know, so, so that we have work and we're moving that. Uh, but, you know, clearly having that long range facilities plan is important. Uh, as far as the position, and I know I, I'm jumping ahead here, but it sounds like so like the 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 new position that would be created as a result of the elimination. It says that they, it's uh, and custodial services. So then, it, would the custodial services then fall under? Um, would they report to their building principal yes. or would they be reporting to this new position? No, to the building principal. So they but, but, but they would be getting central office support. Meeting so they would, that would be their that. central office support. That's right. I mean, there, and they would work not, in. Right. Okay. There, there would be an awful lot of coordination you know, with that. Uh, but, you know, essentially we're forming that team. You know, and, and, you know, quite often we've received, you know, in terms of some, some reference of frustrations, you know, in terms of things not being done. Now we associate that with money, you know, in, in terms of limitations, you know, and that limitations don't seem to be addressed. So again, it comes back to what's the long range plan here. You know, we can't just keep kicking some things down the road. We're going to have to understand what the needs are, but we also have to put that in perspective of not paying more than what we need to do when we're looking at some of our projects. Um, we are recognizing that um, other schools have put long range plans together. 
Um, so we think we're very capable of doing that. Would we proceed with that? Do we find ourselves needing some help? You know, then then it's going back and revisiting something like this. And that's the logic and reasoning for having the reporting going under finance. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Sense. Do we have the resources internally to get the principals up to speed with this transition? <laughs> Do you know what that question is? I'm, I'm saying, are, are we able to, I don't know why there's laughing because it's a serious question, but I'm asking, are we prepared to give the responsibility of our children's well-being with the custodial side of it to the principals that are already in charge of our children? Are, are we capable of doing that? I, I don't know why never, somebody would laugh about it. I, I, it's quite I, insulting, actually. I, I believe, we're taking away the credit of our principles. Yeah, I, I believe we are. It's a team effort. You know, we want to make sure and say in that our primary purpose of our principles is being instructional leaders within the schools. Uh, but it's, again, also if there's a need and if there's a facility need that well, they would know. They, they? they would know. And again, you know, had custodials, you know, working with maintenance staff, uh, you know, so there'd be a lot of co coordination that had custodial person would take a you know critical role and again we're, we're talking about um, between now uh, and the end of the year because this would be you know essentially a new year implementation uh, even though we'd be working in transitional ways uh, to get uh, primed up for that but but who's going to do the sorting now is who's going to have the sort of the overall sort of coordinating you know picture of the of, of, of the whole the whole system like, you know, principals, I'm, I'm sure they don't have to work very hard to find things that they want to see done right now. And I would guess every school would be, I don't, I, I you know, somebody's got to referee that. And who, that, who is that going to be? That, that would be this manager. That manager will play. Oh, okay. and, and as well as, you know, don't underestimate your head custodians either. Oh, no, I don't underestimate them at all. It's just that. You know, there's so many needs, and uh, you know, and it's it, it's 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 kind of, it could be kind of a free for all in some ways. I mean, and I I just don't want to see it settled by by the squeakiest wheels. I mean, I think there has to be professional decisions. Have we heard from the principals and also Angela as far as taking on these? Um, New responsibilities. I, I have discussed with Angela, and you know, my my majority of my discussion you know, on in terms of our maintenance has been Lincoln High School, mm -hmm. the largest facility, and you know, you know, probably with greatest need. And I think that there's a very much an openness there. Uh, but I've also talked with Jamie on the instructional side. You know, we do not want to take away from the instructional leaders. You know, so it is really working it to you know build up that support in terms of how we coordinate this work. You know, how the custodian works with the maintenance department. You know, to to uh, get things moving and, and done, and I think it's also with that. You know, if we have a perpetual problem with, okay, we have X amount of dollars for you to take on maintenance projects, and every year, the the same problems get missed and passed on, and they never get resolved. You know, so somehow this comes back down to that that plan. You know, to make sure that we have a plan. And if we have a recognized need that we somehow take that on, you know, does that mean at some point in time down the road that we actually get into a facilities referendum, you know, a capital referendum that very well could be, you know, we were kind of walking with that something we're ready to take on now. And I said, no, I don't, I don't have enough information. Um, you know, and that's where we started getting Nexus involved and stuff like this. So there is a lot more, you know, planning that needs to be done. A lot of this is driven by budget, and that's why, again, that's why Angela, you know, is involved because that's part of the things that she's been pushing for. I need detail. You know, we need to have plans, and, and you know, so I think she's been instrumental in terms of helping already organize component. But there's more work to be done here. But Angela can't make building decisions. No, but this, I mean, this she can is, make the money. Decisions. This is this is an answer, but it's also helping facilitate getting things in. There's you know, quite often there's a support arm, even with school business officials. This is a major com component of their responsibility. This is not uncommon. This is much more of common practice. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, uh, all those in favor to uh, eliminate the director of buildings and grounds position um, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah, I think I can. So put me down as a aye. All right, and our next um, item on here is the proposed position elimination of the buildings and grounds operations supervisor. 
So I have a motion and a second um, for that. Okay, any discussion on that position? <laughs> Similar Six rationale, correct, Jim? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, seeing in, um, none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, okay, and then the uh, next position on here is Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Um, and do I have a motion and a second? Make a motion. I'll second. Okay, any discussion on that? Uh, yeah, Jim, uh, maybe uh, touch on rationale on the, uh, the uh, movement there too as well. Well, again, I, I think as everybody's acknowledged in uh, a lot of our discussion already today, yes, we have um, a serious um, issue to deal with, and that's reading levels. You know, in terms of with only 30% and less of our kids are reading at grade level, we've identified this as not only a serious problem, but a significant opportunity. Uh, you know, so some of it was uh, making sure that I looked in terms of you know, what's our instructional focus? You know, what is it going to take? You know, are we going to continue to do component pieces like uh, another curriculum uh, in incremental, or do we need something more significant regarding a systems approach to addressing some of our issues and elevating the achievement of our students? So I already uh, put in place a key component of this, obviously, with my recommendation your support of my hiring uh, 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 Mrs. McCall and uh, yeah, Mrs been part of the change here both in terms of the positions being eliminated and positions being replaced is the significant amount of the supervision he moves you know from two directors to to jamie um, you know into this process but there is an awful lot of work that still needs to be done so so it's looking at some efficiencies it's also moving support you know out of central office and working that closer to um, um, support in in the schools and closer to the classroom you know, so they're there, you know, we're not talking about all, you know, we're talking about, you know, some of these key, you know, positions um, uh, that we think this is, this is the right move. To help bridge disconnect yep. from central office to, you know, in front. Any questions about that at all? Okay, um, all in favor of um, the elimination of the Curriculum, Director of Curriculum Instruction, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And then we have on the proposed position, elimination of Director of Teaching, Learning, and Assessment position. Do I have a motion and a second for that? We have a motion. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion on that position? Okay. Seeing none, um, all those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, and then we have um, uh, some positions to add then uh, that will um, be a combination of some of the ones that were eliminated or doing different roles. Um, so our first one here is a proposed new position um, for manager of buildings, grounds, and custodial. Do I have a motion and a second to approve that? Make a motion. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion on that position? Okay. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. And um, our next one is the uh, Director of Educational Programs. And um, do I have a motion and a second to accept that new position? I'll make a motion. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion about that position? Yeah. What is the SLL committee? What is the SLL committee? Uh -huh. Student learning liaisons. Oh, okay. What is that? Uh -huh. Good question. <laughs> I mean, it's in the description. I just don't, you know, the acronyms, I mean, honestly. There's some of us who are outsiders to the jargon, so uh, I always meet them. Pam, can you speak to the SLL? I didn't read the joint description, so what was the specific uh, item in that um, 
Well, it's in the essential duties and no, responsibilities. The question was, it what says, is the student learning committee? Committees. I don't know yeah. how it's defined. Okay. Coordinate and lead SLL committee meetings. Uh, I don't, you know, I wouldn't know an SLL yeah. if it's hit me in the hall. But, um, so I can address that for you. Currently, it's like a department lead that you have in your building, and you have several of them. So you have, it's an elementary, middle, and high school level that would lead a specific department like uh, English language arts or science okay. or social studies. And it okay. would be a person that is at the district that is coordinating those groups of people when they're pulled together and they're doing additional work. It's actually in the- Is there a better way to say that other than yeah. in the acronym? Kerry, it says it in the job description. What would, what would explain it bullet. to you better? Well, in your explanation. Responsible for yeah, it says it in the bullet that it is uh, the that? exact verbiage is coordinates and leads SLSL, SLL meetings responsible for mentor mentee programs for teachers. It's like a Lua what used to be different. Okay, all right. Well, that helps. Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, it's not brain damage, it's just you know, I get a clear communication. <laughs> Okay, any other uh, questions in that position? Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, and then our um, final position, um, new position would be the Director of State and Federal Programming and Assessments. Um, do I have a motion and a second? I'll make a motion. A second. Okay, any discussion about that? Uh, you can go, Colin. I I guess I just you know for the sake of the the fact of just letting people know what these these are. Um, if people if uh, you can touch on what the what that job is and how that's going to be related to our district. Jamie, what? Yeah, I'm capable of job description, so I'm agnostic. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the state and federal programs are looking at more of the Title I um, at risk. We'd be looking at any grants that the district receives that has to administer them, that has state reporting guidelines that are attached to them. Mm -hmm. We'd also be looking for someone who was able to secure grant funding in areas that might enhance our programming. And when I say that, I don't mean you're chasing money. I, I say you're looking for resources to support what you're doing, and there's a big difference in the two. Sure. Any oh, questions? Going are on? we doing this currently very well? Um, I'm not seeing us securing grants that we could be securing. Okay. Okay. We do get we do get state and federal grants though. So I don't want to make a sound like we don't currently get them, um, but there might be other grants like early childhood grants, which is um, where Ohio is able to offer all day four year old programming. It's through a grant from the state that they do apply for. Is that a, is that a repetitive uh, position where it would require a full time. I mean, uh, it, it, is it something that would have a sunset disposition? Obviously, when we secure a bunch of yeah. uh, grants, would that be something that would go away, or no? It no. continues. Yes. <laughs> well, if you read the description, I, but it may be, it may be it's it it read it, yes, I'm for itself. partially <laughs> leaving to. Yes. There is a hard component of that. Right? Yes, that's really important. Obviously, I wanted to mention that. Okay, um, any other questions uh, regarding that position? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, motion uh, by saying, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, and then um, we have um, our last unfinished business is our superintendent contract. Um, and so we need a motion a second to approve uh, the contract. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. Okay. Any um, discussion regarding that? I just have a question. Um, on page two, six certification, uh, the superintendent shall hold a valid district administrative certificate issued by the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction qualifying him to act as superintendent. My understanding is that the 
that you currently have a provisional, a provisional certificate, a provisional license. I have a license of reciprocity license. It runs through June 30, and then we'll be working. I know it works. We come, you know, to June 30th, yeah. and then. So, is there are there provisions that have to be fulfilled for for it to be removed? You know, I'm not sure in terms of what the renewal one is. I know that my license in, in Michigan, which is based on the okay. reciprocity, has been renewed. I've got another oh, okay. five years out there okay. you know, with, with Michigan. Okay. Uh, and that's where, you know, that reciprocity. So there's reciprocity. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you for the negotiation ability that uh, was undertaken. And it's a big feat. Um, so thank you very much for accepting the challenge. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the superintendent contract uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Okay, then we have um, some items of new business that came from our uh, January 9th personnel meeting. Um, and uh, this does not need a motion in a second uh, because we did um, do that in our committee. And uh, Mike, do you want to talk just a little bit about um, this item here? Sure. Uh, teacher contracts, liquidated damages. And um, I'm proposing that, that we increase the liquidated, liquidated damages uh, penalty for breaking the contract according to those dates that you see in front of you. And the reason I'm doing, I'm proposing that is because, especially during a school year, when a teacher breaks a contract and goes to another district, uh, that's most often the case. It, it has become very labor intensive to find a sub or to replace the teacher with a teacher. And as a result of becoming so labor intensive, uh, it's only reasonable that we increase our fees slightly. In addition to that, since I've been here, we've had three or four teachers who have left December, January-ish, mid-year, and have only given the district like about a two-week notice. And a two-week notice is the norm for support staff, but a two-week notice is really, really not sufficient for professional staff. So I'm, I'm asking you to consider adding that last sentence that says, after school starts, with less than a 30 day notice, the penalty will be a two will be two thousand dollars. In other words, if if they're going to resign and leave us and not give us 30 days notice, their fee is going to increase by five hundred dollars. It's 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 very important that they start to realize that they need to give us a 30 day notice or more time to find a satisfactory replacement. So that's why I'm hoping that uh, we can consider adding this language to their contracts and also the, this language would be oh geez sorry serious talk okay thanks mike um any questions at all about that um, like when was the last time we updated that amount i do not know sorry and is this standard practice to these amounts yes matter of fact um after i after i considered doing these amounts i passed this by our legal counsel and uh, asked asked him if it was if the, if he deemed that they that they're reasonable, given the labor intensive uh, to to replace people, and he indicated yes that that, that that these fees are reasonable. Okay, thank you, uh, Mike. Do you feel that these are actually uh, do they prevent uh, what it is that they're? I mean, do you do they actually are they gonna? Do you think this will actually help to stop two week notice versus a 30 day? Would something like this actually, or is this just a uh, a way to slap on the hand? No, I'm really hopeful so that, that as we impress upon our professional staff that a 30 day notice is, is reasonable, is prudent, uh, is expected, that the 30 day notice will, notice will become uh, just a standard practice in the district and that. Uh, that that'll become the norm going forward. Um, that's my hope. That's my intent. It's not intended to be punitive. Um, but if they can't give us 30 day notice for whatever reason, 
then they put a real bind on 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 our educational system. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's our students that aren't getting the best instruction that they deserve. Uh, you have to get more than thirty days notice to vacate in the farm. Right, and, and I, I and I wasn't yeah, yeah. I just I wanted to make sure that it's. I mean, I would yeah, I mean, not just a punitive action. I'm not for the death yeah. penalty. But I think two thousand is reasonable. Right, yeah, we had a we have a motion in the second. Um, really? Yeah, oh, yeah, that came Especially on committee. Right uh huh. Yeah. Um, so, are there any further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Um, all in favor of uh, changing our teacher contracts, liquidated damages uh, to the amounts and the thirty day notice upon resignation, um, as listed here under new business. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? A okay, motion carries. Okay, and then we do have um, some new special education paraprofessional position requests. Um, one is at Monroe Elementary. I'll take these both separately. Um, and uh, so do I have a motion? And Well, we don't need a motion a second because, again, those came out of personnel. Are there any um, uh, questions regarding that? And Katie, I would um, just if you want to give everybody a little background about uh, both of these real quickly. Sure, the Monroe position is as a result of a new special education referral. Um, a kindergartner who is in need of some significant support in order to navigate the general ed environment successfully. And the other one is the early learning um, position at Riverview for our three year olds and our four year olds. And again, that's the result of 20 students transferring in since the beginning of the school year. So, um, just a, another support for our earliest learners. Okay, so any discussion on the Monroe Elementary position? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, signify aye. by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and then also the um, new special education paraprofessional, paraprofessional position at Riverview Early Childhood. Any discussion about that? Okay, seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, um, other business, um, just a, a few remarks. Um, I know that um, we did put out to staff, but there was um, some concern that um, since Mrs. McCall um, has a, a residence in Michigan, um, that we were paying for airfare and also um, her travel expenses, um, driving, um, hotel rooms, um, and that that was um, somehow in her contract. Um, that isn't true. Uh, so we put that out to uh, principals and staff to make sure that they all knew that um, and could spread that word. Um, and I think that's all I have. Um, future meeting dates. Um, one of the things, of course, we need to talk about is uh, we picked the, the, obviously, the second Tuesday um, of February, um, but the uh, we have a problem because February is a shorter month. So um, the last day of the month, which I believe is the 28th, yep. the fourth Wednesday, the fourth, so. when, fourth Wednesday is going to going into. It's the week after March. the second Tuesday. Right. So um, what we'd like to do is um, instead of meeting on that Wednesday, we would go back to meeting on that Tuesday. So we would have one two weeks. Um, apart from each other. So that would be the 8th and the 28th, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right? Eight, I'm sorry, the 14th. The 14th. Yes. So we can spend Valentine's Day together oh. and the 28th. What? Yeah. 8th and 14th? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and other meeting dates, uh, the first uh, Wednesday of the month, um, which is coming up, will be our executive committee meeting. Um, and does everyone else want to run through? February Angela? 4th for buildings and grounds. February, February 1st. First for buildings, buildings and grounds. Okay. We're working on finding a time just um, before the next day. Okay. So. Perfect. Any okay, curriculum? We're still looking at it tomorrow. Okay. And um, has ad hoc said a meeting as well? 
Um, we do have a small core group of ad hoc people that are meeting with Jamie and Jim, and Jim and we'll be meeting on the first. Okay. Um, and then we did pick a day to reach out. Okay. Yeah, um, I, want, I, want, I want to return to that uh, the 8th and the 14th thing. I'm sorry. The 14th and, 20, and the 28th. 14th and the 28th of February. Well, there's no four that's the 22nd. That's what you're saying. Okay. All right. Um, then that concludes our regular uh, scheduled meeting here. Um, we do need to um, a motion in a second to go into closed session um, to consider the employment promotion compensation or performance evaluation data of a public employee over which the government body has jurisdiction exercise its responsibility. This meeting is authorized pursuant to section 19.85 subsection 1c of the Wisconsin statutes to um, go over superintendent evaluation progress goals and objectives. Um, do I have a motion and a second? Um, motion. Second. A second? Second. Second. Mm, before okay. I vote, I need to I need to be a pain again. Yes. Um, you know, is this a policy and process issue or is this a personnel issue? I mean, I, I, I thought we had evaluated the, the, the superintendent. So <laughs> evaluate progress goals and objectives seems to be more a policy or process issue, which is not which is not one of the exemptions in the closed session. I mean, if we're talking about getting the, where are you getting that from? From the open meeting law. No, I know. You're saying policy and progress. Is that what you're saying? What are we going to talk about in the meeting, in the closed meeting? It says it right there. Yeah, well, I want to know the nature of that. I mean, are we going to talk about, are we going to do further evaluation of the gym file? Or are we just going to talk about yeah, what Jim. the process, the goals, and objectives? And if that's all we're going to talk about. We can't do that in closed session. Jim's progress. So if he's not, I know, I know. If Jim is not doing what we expect him to be doing, he's okay. not meeting his right. goals. All right, that's what then I we ask. need to do that in a confidential setting. Right, because you know, open meeting is kind of an issue, and I just want to make sure that people understand what's going to be discussed there, so that we're not, you know, I can vote for that. If that's yeah. what we're going to do. Okay. Okay. And then when you're in the meeting, you can also, you know, when you're in that closed session capacity, you can also then hold us to that. And oh, as yeah, I'm not going to be a cop. But yeah, no, I mean, mean, no, no, no. I mean, yeah. just even, hey, guys, stay on track, you know, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, All right. yeah. Okay. That's okay. okay. I can vote. All right. So we have a motion and a second, um, and we do need a roll call vote for that. Colin yeah. Brunel. Aye. Matthew Phipps. Aye. Stacy Selner. Aye. Matthew Swallow, Carrie Trask. Yes. Tony Vostelica. Aye. And Kathy Willis. Aye. Okay, we're now in closed session. It is HH. All right, we can go to the bathroom. Yes. <laughs>